when people are more aware of those of those internal issues and the, the internal kind of factors and stuff i think that creates or that enables a community a society that is more of understanding more accepting of people who stutter and hopefully with all that then they are able to understand that when you engage with the person who has a stutter all you really have to do is provide the space and time for them to say the words that they want to say and just solely by doing that you can really change the trajectory of a person's day that is the positive impact that can happen for a person who stutters when they're just provided that time to say what the, what they want to say. Welcome to the Emerging Minds podcast. Hi, you're with Nicole Rollbush. On today's episode, I'm joined by Rich Stevens and Mitchell. Rich is the president of the Stuttering Association for the Young Australia, more commonly referred to as Say Australia. While Mitchell has been involved with Say Australia for the last four years, first as a participant and now as a mentor to other children and young people. Both Rich and Mitchell have a stutter and they're here today to talk about what it's like growing up with a stutter, how it can impact children's mental health and what people can do to best support children who have a stutter. It's great to have you both here. Rich, could you start by telling us a little bit about what Say Australia provides to children? Yeah, we help and support the kids and teens who stutter from the ages of um, seven up to 18 years old. And what we do is we provide a space where they can be their true authentic selves, where we celebrate their voices, we celebrate their stutter. We provide this this accepting space, this community almost, um, where it's a safe space where there's acceptance, where there's empathy, a lot of love and a lot of support and a lot of listening as well you know a lot of listening where we invite these kids to share their stories to share their voices to share themselves in a space where we have a lot of fun as well but the essence of it as well a big part of what we do is we provide the unique the unique opportunity for young and kind of people who stutter to meet other young people who stutter um because for a lot of young people who stutter they can go throughout their childhood without ever meeting anyone who has a stutter. So to come into a space where they meet the kids and teens who they sound like them, they are just like them, in this space where the only ask that we ask of anyone in our space is to be themselves. And so within that space, we provide, um, so, there's, so there's three arms to the, to the, to the programming that we offer. We offer the social hangs that are in person here in Melbourne, um, and they are online as well in the Zoomosphere. Um, so we offer all that free. We offer a camp, a summer camp as well. And then a big part of what of what we do is we offer um, our Confident Voice, Voices program, which is 100% free. And that is our creative arts, a performing arts and kind of program where we invite the young people into our space to create, um, to work together in small groups and to create these original and kind of pieces and be that songwriting, be that playwriting, be that spoken word. We use the arts as a vessel really, um, as a tool for them to kind of share their voice, for them to be able to express themselves however way they want. And to also introduce the arts to them where in the past, they might not have ever been invited into the arts and stuff, or they thought the arts is not for me because I'm a person who has a stutter. Am I going to be picked? Am I, you know, am I going to be able to get up on the stage and have the time and the space that I need to say those lines or stuff? So, what we do is we use the arts as that tool, but the arts is really the wallpaper of the room. Um, if that makes sense. So, in the middle of the room, it's the connectivity and stuff. It's the friendships. It's the it's a safe space where, where they're seen, where they're heard and where they're loved for their true authentic selves. So even though we are Melbourne based, we operate on a national, on a, on a level as well. Um, and we've been connecting with kids who stutter, oh, I think for four years now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know a lot about stuttering, so I'm really curious to learn a bit more about the experience. How common is it and um, how does it usually present in kids? So it's really kind of common, really, with kind of young and kind of people of, of the early school age. From the research that it, that 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 is done on a global scale, you you tend to see the same and kind of numbers across the world, really. So the range of the percentage of kids, I'd probably say the early, of the uh, of the early school age is you know can range anywhere from nine to eleven percent of school age children in those early years um, across the globe. Adults, we're looking at one percent of of the population, which is a lot, which is a lot of people, and that is something that, as people who stutter um, for the kids and the children, and, pro- and probably a lot of adults, and probably a lot of pe- uh, people in general, don't realise how common it is across the world. Really, so that is um, within that age range of the children who have a disfluency in those early years. And the research has shown that probably pro- probably a third of those children will go on to have a stutter for for the rest of their lives, like um, like me. I'm a person who stutters and stuff, and I continue to to stutter throughout my childhood and throughout my adulthood. So it's very common. And what you would tend to see, so it's kind of like if you think about having a stutter as an iceberg. All we see is the tip of the iceberg, and if you relate that to having a stutter, what you see would be the repetitions, which could be on a word or on a syllable. Um, You could see a prolongation, so a prolongation of a sound, Um, same, a word or a syllable, Um, or you could, or you could, or you could see also a block as well. And that's the voice block um, where the where you can hear the air that is kind of trapped or the word. It kind of feels and kind of trapped in the person's mouth, in the throat. Or it could be a silent block, which is exactly <laughs> what it is. It's it, like it's silent. And that is quite hard for people um, who probably don't have a lot of experience around other people who stutter to really see that really. But what is what people tend to not see is the bigger part of the iceberg is everything that is it that that like if it, like if I continue an analogy um, of, of an iceberg is under the level of the sea. What you don't see, so what people don't tend to see, you know, is a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, a lot of embarrassment, a lot of isolation, a lot of loneliness, because it's quite rare as a child that you'd meet another person, another child who has a stutter. Um, and also the fear of speaking, the fear of speaking, the fear of being f- found out as a person who has a stutter, because a common theme in my experience, uh, you know, in my experiences now, when I've got to know a lot of people who have a stutter, when they've shared about their childhood, the fear of speaking was so great that, um, well, the fear of speaking would... It the fear kind of comes from what a reaction is from other people. So if you think of bullying, if you think of the mimicking, if you think of the name calling. So what a lot of people who stutter, what they realize to not be found out as a person who has a stutter is to be silent. Because if you don't speak, you'll never stutter. And 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 unfortunately that's a tragedy that happens to like a lot of young people and to a lot of adults as well. And I think what a lot of people don't realize, and this fact that I'm going to share, it's across the world, you know, almost everyone I know who has a stutter, almost everybody I know and everyone I've spoken to, irrelevant of where you're born, in the country, irrelevant in terms of culture, in terms of language, you know, I'd say like 99.9% of people who I've met who have a stutter and all the stories I've heard, they always um, stutter on a certain word and that word is their name. And if you think of the impact of that, how many times do we say our name a day? How many times are we asked our name? And I think what it comes down to is like there's to say 
to say your name is one thing, but a lot of it is a reaction. And that is something that comes with the goal of getting awareness out there, really. And the great thing about awareness is if you only think of the tip of the iceberg as as a person who has a stutter, if that's all you all you know and all you learn, then that can be really, really, really kind of hurtful for people who stutter and stuff. And when people are more aware of those, of those internal issues and the, the internal kind of factors and stuff, I think, I think that creates or that enables a a like a community, a society that is more of understanding, more of accepting of people who stutter. And hopefully with all that, then they are able to understand that when you engage with the person who has a stutter, all you really have to do is provide the space and time for them to say the words that they want to say. And just solely by doing that, you can really change the trajectory of a person's day. Um, that is the that is the the impact, the po- the positive impact that can happen for a person who stutters when they're just provided that time to say what the, what they want to say. Mm, yeah, and I wanted to ask you specifically about what the um, impact on mental health and well being can be for kids. You've touched a little bit on some of the things that come up, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think. Um, like I think when we go for all of the research that that has been done um, in the field of stuttering, the figures that tend tend to tend to come out. Um, I think people who stutter, children who stutter, um, are maybe thirty three percent more likely to experience social anxiety, which can carry on into adulthood. I think. There's a high percentage of people, of people who stutter, of children who stutter, t- t- to be bullied um, at school, and there's a high percentage. If you think of all the communication d- d- difficulties that and kind of children have, what what they have seen that and kind of young people who stutter are more uh, more aware at an earlier age that they have a difference, and what they've also seen in the st- like in the studies of um, is that the peer group at such an early age, I think it was like four years old or five years old, the peer group who are fluent um, don't want to spend as much time with people who have a stutter because it's all about communication, isn't it, and stuff. And it's all about like when there's a bar- when there's a, bar- a barrier there, that that can affect those early friendships. Like when we talk of mental health, when we talk of the impact, um, of having a stutter and if you grow up in an environment where where you don't get that time and you don't get that space then long periods of isolation can can happen long period long periods of not you know not, you know of not being able to share our voice and um, can go on for many many years and if you think of when we when we're not in a safe space to kind of share our thoughts share our dreams share our feelings when that is all um, kept kept inside that can be a burden you know it can be huge and kind of, and kind of burden on 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 a young person's shoulders and i think what what has been shown in the research and stuff is that the so the social anxiety um this fear of speaking can continue into adulthood and stuff. It can, can you know, it, it can continue into adulthood. Um, it can have a negative impact on education. So that fear can bleed into a lot of things. It can bleed into your choice of career. You know, it can bleed into, am I ever going to meet a partner who is going to accept me as a person who has a stutter? What's it going to be like in higher education? What's it going to be like in college? What's it going to be like in the work environment? Like, you know, am I going to have to hide it from people? Is that what I'm going to have to do to be successful in life and to survive almost? So, so you know, the mental health part is huge. Yeah, yeah, so such significant impacts. Mitch, I'd really love to hear 
about your experience and um, your perspective of what it's been like growing up with a stutter. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, sure. So as a, like a, oh, I'll probably say in like primary school, I like had no like care about how I talked or anything. I actually didn't even like, I don't even remember stuttering that much in like prep grade one, grade two even. It was probably more at like when I started getting older and all that, like in grade four, grade five, grade six, and I'm like, oh, no, I've I've like got this thing where I like can't talk how other kids are talking, how my footy team are talking, how... My t- how my parents are talking and, like, family members and all that. Mm. So then that started, like, yeah. And I started getting a bit anxious in, like, grade five, grade six, trying to talk in front of sc- uh, school kids, teachers, even my sports teams were, like, not, like introducing myself because, like, trying, trying to say my name and introduce myself to new people is so hard. Mm. Um, and then in grade five, I had to do this speech where we had to get this, like, oh, I wanted to get this sports captain role for the school mm-hmm. so then I had to like make this speech and all that that was good then like standing up trying to talk in front of everyone I was like shaking the paper mm-hmm. everything I was so nervous about it then as I like started introducing myself obviously I couldn't get my name out so it was probably too Minutes, I finally got one name out and then some kids were like trying to tell me to hurry up, to ask me what my name is and all that. And then then I was like, like, I'm a, I'm like what the hell is going on and all that. And then I look at my teacher and then she goes, just keep go- going. So I kept going. Oh, and then I got anxious about whether or not if I got it. But then two weeks after the speech, I got good news that I got the sports captain role. So that grew some my confidence a lot. Then in grade six, had to like uh, do a speech in front of all of the school kids, parents, and all that on every Friday, I think. And yeah, the first two ones we were so nervous because it was like something new pretty much. And then after that, yeah, I was uh, like talking really well, everything. Then to start in high school was probably the most hardest thing ever because like I think I only knew two or three kids from primary school that was I went to high school, so, like, trying to introduce myself and all that was, like, really, like, overwhelming and exhausting and that was probably my worst year, like, mentally and physically as well because I would get, like, pain in, like, my cheeks and jaws just trying to talk and then, yeah, and also talking about mental health, like, yeah, that was probably one of the worst, like, years of my life. I was acting out at school, getting suspended in school, getting suspended in my sports team, and then also thoughts about, like, self-harm and all that. And then, yeah, that's something that I don't really like to look back on, but I've but I know, like, with the support of friends, family, they've, and, and even Australia as 
Well, they've done so much to help me, me be the person who I am. So, yeah, that's that's me. Yeah, well, <laughs> thanks for sharing that, Mitch. Um, it sounds like you've experienced a lot, but you've come a long way yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like, um, yeah, it's only, only yes, yeah, Australia Australia's only been here for four years, but it feels a lot like I've been there for like my whole entire lo- life, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah, that must be a good feeling to have, yeah, to have yeah. that support and that connection as well that Rich was talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah. Is. And what about for you, Rich? I think, you know, growing up as someone with a stutter, as well. Can you talk a little bit about, if you think back to when you were a kid or a young person, what would have helped you feel safe and supported? I remember um, I spoke in a different way early on and stuff. I remember trying to say my name when I was like four or five in school and it just feeling stuck. It just feeling stuck and not knowing what was going on. And I remember, yeah, I think the teacher was kind of, I don't know, I think Oh, I'm trying to think of a description there. Maybe like in shock because it happened all of a sudden. So those early years, I noticed a difference. I remember going to therapy when I was about six or something. Um, I remember playing with a lot of toys in the corner, a lot of trains and trying to join my speech up as a train and the carriages and so not taking a breath in between words, doing the very the rhythmic approach into speech. And I remember these the SLP talking to my parents a lot. My parents were like, great. They were like, awesome. They never clipped my wings. They just, my mum always wanted to talk about it. She always wanted to talk about how many times I stuttered, you know, um, how was school? Was I reading today? Was it hard? And all these things. And then my daddy was very different, my dad. My dad was, he didn't talk about it a lot. I think in later years, I realized he actually shared actually he had a stutter as a child and a young adult and he never shared that with me until I was about 30, 32 or 33. And and I get why, because I think he felt a lot of guilt that he was the cause. So I understood that, but I know they found it hard because they didn't know any other parents. They weren't introduced to any, to any other parents of children who had a stutter. And I know they internalized a lot and it was a shame really and stuff because Part of what we try and do is try to connect parents of children who stutter so they're not alone as well. In school, I do remember it was more internal. It was more, I remember when I, I think I was eight years old and I was watching Father the Bride, not the Steve Martin one, the Spencer Tracy one. And I remember this and, you know, and obviously in the film, he, um, he has a daughter who gets married and at some point I think he does a speech and I remember being eight years old and thinking wow if I have a daughter and she gets married how can I do a speech as a person who stutters and I'm eight years old and I should not be having those thoughts at eight years old I should be more thinking about taking my bike out or I think I, d- I don't know what was on at the time I think it was the Batman film and the Turtles film and all that and those are the things I should have been thinking about but that was a big thing for me it was those internal I had a year of of an SLP I think when I was like 12 um, who had a stutter and it was a bloke who had a stutter and stuff um, yeah I was thinking, who's this guy? And I was thinking, I've got to introduce myself all over again. And he introduced himself and he stuttered. And he stuttered and for that year, it was great and stuff. We worked on a bit of fluency, but he just allowed me that that space and to share really. Yeah, for sure. It sounds like your experience was, um, I guess, has led to your passion with the work that you do at, say, Australia, providing that space for, for kids. Yeah, um, I just want to give kids and teens who stutter, you know, a thing that I didn't have. Yeah. And it is a drive and it is, and it's a passion and it gets you up at five o'clock in the morning to answer those emails of new families. But yeah, but like, I'm very fortunate to be where I am and to be in a, in a position where I am. But yeah, and I'm very fortunate to meet people along the way who really care, who want to make a difference. Like, yeah, like this guy who's next to me, you no, know, I mean, in terms of Mitchell, came to our program four years ago now. Wow. Four years. Wow, man. Wow. And 
Yeah, and to and to and to see him just to do his thing, to be himself, and yeah, like and to know that that is hard, and it's still hard, but to do it, and to do it in our space, and yeah, as a young person in our space, and then to come through as an adult now, and you know now he's helping other young people who stutter. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm fortunate. Um, I'm in a space where I, you know. I'm able to provide that space, but, but you know, these are the people of the future and stuff and it's great to see them and it's great to provide a platform. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So you nodding along to a bit of what Rich was saying, Mitchell, yeah. um, I guess some of that resonated with you as well. Yeah. Well, just touching on what Rich said, like just creating that space for like kids who've never, uh, seen or heard and the and the how the kid their age started it before and, and then finally walking through the doors seeing that the there's heaps well a few you, you kids their age there they could they like all there's an example of like uh these two also awesome kids James and Le, Leo they've as as soon as they've they need to shoot. Yeah. How that they've they've created this tight knit close friendship, and it's just awesome. And seeing them mingle with each other every every sat it day for like two hours. Yeah, it's it's all it's all what me, makes me always uh all excited for ever 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 he sat at a morning seeing all the all of these kids faces and all of the other volunteers and and our riches all wow just makes me like feel so much so much and he could him on the oceans yeah, yeah. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about the mentoring. Um, what's that been like, kind of stepping into a bit of a new role? Uh, well, I've kind of had, like, I guess the experience where, because I'm all, so in my, my family, I'm the oldest of a nine career. Well, not in my family, like family, but like cousins and all that. So though I always look after, well, I try, try my best to look after all of them. So I'm like a good role model for them. So I've, I've, ju- I've ju- just been somewhat like t- t- taking my, like me looking after my cousins into into this space, like just... Yeah, being a good role model for all these kids, so, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I already grew up having that experience, so it's quite a natural role to to go into. Yeah, for sure. Well, we have to leave our conversation there for now, but thank you so much to both of you for joining me and to our audience for listening in as well. I'll be continuing my conversation with Rich and Mitchell in part two of this podcast, so I hope you can join us again for the second half of our conversation soon. Bye for now. Visit our website at www.emergingminds.com.au to access a range of resources to assist your practice. Brought to you by the National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health, led by Emerging Minds. The National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health under the National Support for Child and Youth Mental Health Programme.